Good evening. My name is Monica Meller, and I'm the Foundation's Coordinator in the Division of Creative Arts, and I'm happy to welcome you to tonight's lecture. Before we get to our speakers, please note that our student exhibit opens at the Roland Art Center on Monday, April 5th, and runs through April 28th. Tonight's lecture will be presented by Eric Carlson, USF Studio Art Faculty in the 3D area, and USF Gallery Director, Justin Johnson. Each artist will present highlights and techniques from their studio art practice and the messaging behind their work. Carlson holds a BFA from Illinois State University and an MFA from the University of Missouri. Johnson holds both a BA and an MA from the University of St. Francis. This lecture is generously sponsored by the Three Rivers Federal Credit Union, and we would like to thank them for that. The artist will answer question in the foyer, foyer after the lecture, and please note that the galleries, the Lupke Gallery, uh, which includes work by both artists, as well as Carolee Wade and Ashley Beatty, will be open after this lecture. And with that, I would like to welcome Eric Carlson. to take this off and actually talk. So a little bit about myself before I start is one thing I talk about a lot within my work is duality. It even kind of described myself. One of the key things that I always reference back to is music. Music is a heavy influence to me into what I do in the studio. You can usually tell my mood by the music I listen to, but I like stuff that punches me in the gut. This is kind of the same thing as my artwork that I look at as well. So these images stay with me. Uh, one of my favorite artists kept a catalog of images, and that's the same thing that I do. I keep it on the drive, and I constantly go back to those images and even keep it within a sketchbook as well. So oops, can I go back? There we go. So my artistic influences, I keep those up as well. History plays a great deal into what I do. Um, I don't often register myself as an artist. I think of myself as a craft person. I think of myself as many other things at times, but that's just the way I kind of work and think. But once again, like I said, it's a gut check. I tend not to like the pretty things. I wanna find something that really grabs me and grabs my attention and makes me think quite a bit. And that's kind of where my work started. I didn't start off as an artist. Uh, originally, I never thought I was going to go to college. That wasn't on my radar. So my first major was actually athletic training. I liked helping people, I liked working with athletes. Uh, when I went to school, I found out that's one thing that I thought I wanted to do. With a year left, I changed my major. Changed everything, went back home. My mom pushed me to go into art because that's what kept me in high school. Between athletics and art, those two things kept me going. So once again, duality. Not many people think about it that way. So in my undergrad, I was considered angry by a lot of artists and by a lot of professors. They looked at my work and said, you're always angry. You're always amped up. You always have a message. You can't be that way all the time. You're running too hot. But my work, when I was talking about, was violence, specifically gun violence, and kind of my area where I grew up in. Uh, one of those things that I looked at was my side of town was considered the bad side of town where everybody was scared to go. And growing up there, gun violence happened to me quite a few times. By the time I was 18, I was shot at. I had a gun pulled on me multiple times. And the thing was, I didn't get scared, I got angry. And that showed me as a person I had to change as well. So within that, I wanted to start looking and taking that to the gallery space and making people think about it. So I learned how to slip cast. And these forms are actually 36 nine millimeter handguns that were made a mold of. So I wanted to take the space and really make the viewer think about it. When this piece was put up, nobody would stand in front of it. It literally cleared the gallery side to side. And I found that so interesting that 
it literally cleared the people out. It made me think about, well, I took your safety away, so I made you think differently. I changed your space. And within that space, in my senior exhibit, it was all about that. So I was talking about the idea of knowledge. What's more important, street knowledge or book knowledge? The fragility to both. So I thought about a school desk and an inkwell. And within this, I'm combining both of my focuses, which were jewelry and ceramics. So there's books that are slipcast uh, that that desk and that chair are sitting on. So if you sat on that book, you sat on the chair and you sat on that, it would crush all those books. So the fragility of knowledge. In that inkwell, I'm talking back to the idea of street knowledge in this big kind of gaudy necklace that has these smaller pieces in it that actually represent children and childhood. But it was also a place where inkwells used to be placed in desks. So once again, trying to get people to think and go back and forth. And I really wanted the people to touch on that work Going back to that musical influence, I don't know if you know who Wyclef Jean is, but at the time he did a song called Diallo. Amadou Diallo was a African immigrant who was racially profiled, misidentified, shot 41 times for trying to get his wallet. And to me, that started an idea of racial profiling because I grew up and watched that happen to my friends quite a bit having been pulled over in a car and being the only white person in the car, and then going, what are you doing here? Why are you with them? I didn't know that was illegal. So that put that to mind. If I carried this chain that was highly aggressive and had this wallet, would I be profiled the same way? The wallet's meant to look like a gun. So if I pulled that out, would it be the same? It wouldn't. The shell casings are extremely heavy. That's put together with gold links to show the preciousness. And also, the wallet itself is sutured together. It's hand sutured. So I literally got sutures to put it together. Once again, duality. I grew up with a mother who was a nurse, so I had a conscience about my background. Once again, kind of looking at those things, seeing friends who went the opposite way. Shot, prison, paralyzed, and made you think about that work. But once again, that was so serious. I was afraid I was gonna burn myself out. One of my professors is like, you have a sense of humor, let it show. You also have a medical background, look into that a little bit more. So I came up with a silverware set. The anatomy of fine dining. What do you do when you eat? Having to, had to do anatomical dissections, came across as almost the same thing when you're prepping and actually going through it. So I developed my own set of utensils with my fork my knife and my spoon that are all based off of that same kind of setup and doggy bags that are biohazard bags. Once again, tongue in cheek. Because as an artist, when you're doing such work that's very poignant, very aggressive and assertive, you need to find a balance. You can't do that all the time because it weighs on you too much. So that work kind of evolved I took time between undergrad and grad school and really wanted to think where I was going to go and what I was going to do. And I started reflecting on self quite a bit and looking at myself as kind of this idea of a hyper-masculine male. But once again, images come into mind. I don't typically look at standard anatomy and physiology books. I want to look at da Vinci's books. I want to look at French uh, contemporaries as well because I like their anatomical drawings better because they literally had to dissect it and draw it from sight. And that's what I wanted my work to have the same feeling. So I developed a series of work and sculptures within ceramics that were now a self-portrait. But it was kind of a Frankenstein that was put together. The heart is a man is nothing but a man, but it's a working man story. It's about the story of John Henry. In doing the research of John Henry, who was an actual person, he wasn't six foot 11 or six foot what? six foot eight, sometimes seven foot tall. He was actually 5'2", he was a Buffalo soldier. And finding the history of how that came down the line, but I wanted to show the plight of the working man. He worked so hard, his ribs cracked, he worked so hard, his heart broke. So to me, he had a heart attack working for his family. Then going over to the other piece, and relating back, the large foot is actually the foot of Achilles, and it's titled Bama's Boy. 
Because to me, Achilles, if you know the history, Achilles was the first real mama's boy. And that title has always rang out to me because being raised by a single woman, it's kind of a negative stereotype. And I always found that funny to go with that. So Achilles' foot is placed on a bed of arrows. And I wanted you to see that kind of set up, but also that tongue in cheek as well. Is it stable? Is it unstable? And so on. And finally, the next large piece is a hand, and that is based off my great uncle, who was actually 6'8". His wedding ring fit around three fingers. His hands were like base or baseball mitts. He'd literally pick kids up when we were smaller than my daughter by our heads to move us around and kind of shuffle us around like cards. So he was a larger than life story. So I wanted to really go in and kind of dig into that, once again, kind of that working man's plight and really think about that stuff. So my work evolved quite a bit going from the slip cast, the very clean, very precise work to something that now I could dig around in the clay and let it show feeling and emotion. So it's an evolution in myself as well. And I wanted you to be able to see that as we go through stuff. After graduate school, I found out that I could not ship those pieces anywhere. I'd have to transport them, that got extremely expensive. So I wanted to work on smaller work, stuff that I could financially afford to send off to shows. But once again, that still have that scientific kind of background and find stories. Stories have always kind of come in. And when I make work, I'll have many stories, many sketches of things that'll evolve over time until I feel it's the right place for them to go. And both of these pieces are, one is about uh, the blue babies that were in a coal mining area in West Virginia. And the doctor that actually helped figure that out actually wasn't a doctor, he was a tech. And then the one that's lower is uh, based off of sickle cell and what happens with malaria in the body itself. So I wanted to get people to think and kind of educate them as well. So they're almost memorials or mementos. So that's kind of a short-lived work that's still kind of going. My guns evolved. And this is once again poking fun at the hyper-masculine. But also thinking about how we evoke violence and how well it's promoted to children. I grew up in the action hero generation. I grew up in the hyper-masculine generation where you saw heroes have a room full of guns. I was taught to sew at a young age, but I was also told that boys don't sew at the same time. So I wanted to poke back. And with that work, I developed a series of weapon series, this plush weapon series that is actually based with fiber fleece. So it's very soft. It's the same blankets that people usually make kids items with. And it's stuffed with the same thing you'd stuff animals with. What I was trying to do is seduce the viewer into that same area. They're actually able to go up and interact with the work. And it's funny to see because most people will go up and play with it. They'll toss it around, they'll pick it up, you'll watch it. And it's really interesting to see how they act and then suddenly they get what I'm trying to put across. They're cuddling with an AK-47. They're throwing a bomb around like a ball. The bear trap is actually a human bear trap, but it's called, um, how well do you trust me? Because you know nothing about it. Every time this piece is displayed, I'll catch a person lying down in it because it actually hinges shut. This piece was done in 24 hours off of a gallery space that we had. We had to make all the work within 24 hours period. This piece actually went to uh, International Sculpture Show, made it to Sculpture Magazine, and it was just a flight of fancy and kind of an idea to get out there. But it's a playful kind of idea, but it's also, once again, that seduction. And in the top, you see the yellow bomb, which is a quarter scale model of one of the atomic bombs, which is called Fat Man, and the other one's called Blue Boy, Little Boy. And once again, we're relating toys and weapons back to kids and kind of deflating that imagery. And I wanted people to think about that even more so. This is one that's ever evolving and changes, but also whenever I sell a piece, 
proceed goes towards battered women's shelters, battered children's shelters, and stuff like that, because I want people to think about how arts can actually help their community at large. So that's something I play to. These evolved to hand embroidered pieces, and it's kind of very specific for today. Um, the idea of germ warfare, Thinking back historically, handkerchiefs and blankets were given to many native cultures here with smallpox. So I started off with a handkerchief that was embroidered with the texture of what smallpox looked like on the skin. And then that went to the handkerchief series of all these airborne viruses. And what I did was start looking at these things, what they look like under the microscope, taking these fibers, and really pushing the colors to get people to think about it. And, what is it, four years later, after I've started that, we have a major pandemic, which is kind of scary in the same, because I was using face masks as well. But once again, this is an evolving project, because I found it interesting when you sneeze or anything, someone goes to hand you their own personal handkerchief, and that kind of freaked me out. I never wanted that. So I always wanted people to think about things and where they come from. What you mostly know me for here is, of course, making pots. And that really didn't start. I started off when I went back to school uh, with a traditional potter. And that relationship kind of fractured when I started doing the guns and the violence and things like that. He was about ready to retire and kind of pushed me off to the side. And I went to grad school and actually started working with another traditional potter while doing the sculptural works. But the two people I was working with at the time really taught me how to balance myself as a person. And to do that, I found that throwing is an actual release. And a lot of my students will say, when I go into the studio, I'm trying to relax, I throw. And that's one thing I had to learn as an artist. What do you do to balance yourself out? What is that one creative outlet that you have to have? And to me, that's throwing. That's my expression. That's a chance where I can just not think and really let everything kind of push. So this is me working with one of my mentors uh, at his house, at his wood kiln, and kind of enjoying the talk and the camaraderie and kind of that service, which is one thing that really drove me towards ceramics is that idea of community. So those were some focus pieces there. And then, once again, Music got back into one of my head, or into my head space, and I was looking at a Dead Kennedy song. And this is one from when I was a teenager to much later, and it was called Holiday in Cambodia. And in doing the research, it made me research much more and start looking at today's uh, consequences for that action back in the 60s and 70s through the 80s and so on. And there's this group called Adopt the Minefield. And what I found out that there's so many casualties due to this war that we never even really put on the map in this country, we never even thought about. And that people are suffering still today from a war that was that long ago because all the ammunitions that were left in the ground. Kids can't even go out to play. If they take a run or take a walk, they're losing limbs. So what I wanted to do was, once again, I started looking back at the vessel and pushing it and started thinking about it and started making these earthenware forms that were containers or vessels. It's the same thing that a bomb is, the same thing that a weapon is, but it can change destruction. It's a vessel of destruction that is left behind. To me, it's kind of a coward's way out. But at that same time, I wanted to show the fragility of a human being and how I looked at it. So I started making these porcelain rice bowls. And the rice bowl is very specific to the Cambodian setup because if you know the history of the Cambodian killing fields and what was happening, people were rationed to one bowl of rice a day or half of that. And so I wanted people to really see and kind of resonate and hold in their hand and show the fragility of a human at that same time within these pieces. Every one of these pieces actually found the ordinance and made them to spec. So they're all to specific size and scale. Because once again, that's the hyper-realist in me coming back out and going and wanting, wanting everything to be exact and true to form. 
what scared me is in a show, I had one person who was a former military uh, officer walk through and named every specific piece, exactly what it was without looking at a title or anything. He goes, where did you buy these? I'm like, I made them. He's like, I'm probably on the national watch list now, right now too. So with that. But once again, this is always an evolving piece. And once again, proceeds when these are sold, I send it to the adopt a minefield setup where kids can get prosthetics or they make things to help get rid of the mines in those areas. Once again, artist as helping a community. And one of the most recent pieces that I had and sculptural pieces, just to show that I do delve in many different areas once I have an idea because that idea sticks with me forever. It doesn't leave, it has to come out. So this was one when I started seeing kids in cages, I just started thinking of a playpen and what that would look like and how people would react to that same sense of idea. You know, we're so desensitized to what we see on the news that we often forget it. You know, we have so many of those images that hit us, but if I put it in the form of a playpen, would it have that same resonance? Would it stick? And it's kind of a scary thought, scary sight in itself. And finally, and truly going through is my most recent work. And this is one that kind of struck with me even more so because I'm taking forms and I'm deflating them, I'm throwing them into a very specific, straight, rigid structure. But these are all dealing with kind of loss and form and structure, but it's also personal loss because having lost a lot of friends within the past couple of years, it makes you think about your presence in the world and kind of what's left over and how people are attached and what we have. And to me, these are ideas of memories and moments that we all hold on to as far as that goes. So what I'm doing is kind of deflating these forms, allowing them to be free and kind of open, but also in the fact of the functional way that anyone that picks up the forms will have a different interpretation of them. No two people will be able to hold the cup or a bowl or any of those forms in the same way. So they'll have their own personal interaction with the piece. And I think that's what I try to do within a lot of my work is try to make that personal connection because we're taught so much that we shouldn't touch or shouldn't interact. And the ceramicist and the textile and the jeweler in me all come out going, I have to touch everything because I like that personal connection behind that work. And I really want make, to make people think quite a bit. So, I know it's kind of rushed, but just trying to make people think a little bit about stuff. So, that's it. Thank you. While this is loading up, I just have a few thank yous. First of all, in the middle of the room, I'd like to thank my family who are here this evening. Um, for the college students that are watching this on YouTube, you know, when you have a family, um, you need their support to continue as, as an artist. And my family has been so generous with giving me the opportunity and the time to, to get, give some of my energy to this. Uh, studio practice. So again, I thank you to each of you. 
Um, I also want to thank the faculty and students here within the visual arts program. Um, I've been here at USF for a long time, and over the past year especially, it's made me realize how fortunate I've been to be here. And the, the biggest influence in my work in general is just the inspiration I get from fellow faculty members, from other students, um, from the university's art collection, from the visiting artist work that we bring to campus on exhibit. All these things have a profound impact on my own work. And I'm indebted to everyone and all the artwork that comes through this university. So um, unfortunately, uh, I wish I had some uh, nicer work to look at um, after all the heaviness of Eric's work, but unfortunately, um, this is gonna be just as heavy, but um, Eric and I both have similar interests in trying to bring a voice to the voiceless. Um, and, and, and again, uh, these are not necessarily pretty pictures, but I do hope that they're thought provoking. Um, so the, the first place that I'm gonna start is um, on my earlier work. Um, this was what I was producing during my master's degree. And um, at that time I was studying uh, Russian icons, um, illuminated manuscripts, a variety of things and, and that were all spiritual in nature. But one thing that I've always been drawn to is how gold plays such an integral role with how we interact with these works. Uh, gold in terms of the way that light reflects from it and so on has always drawn me into these works, not, and, and obviously the spirituality of these. So in studying these pieces, I was trying to think of a different way to approach gold and work. And from experimentation, I, I found a way to basically apply gold to the interior of glass. And so I've, I've had to explain this process dozens and dozens of times, and sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. But the, the short uh, approach to the process is that I do a, a reverse painting on the interior of the glass surface, and then I mount it to the, the drawing itself. I seam the glass to the drawing, to the mount, and they become one. And so I'm able to, to be pretty aggressive with the approach to the gold um, I can do things much differently on the glass than I could if the if the gold was on paper, and, it, and it's much easier to work with than gilding or, or other gold sources. Um, this is titled Sanctuary, and, and at this time I was still kind of drawn to the the figure, um, you know, the 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 artists that I studied under are all figurative in nature, and so I kept kind of going back to that. This is called Meditation, and this vertical composition you'll see repeated in later work. Um, I did a, a series of pieces based on saints, and so uh, I would always include kind of the, the tools of their martyrdom or the tools of, their, of the symbolism behind these saints. This is Saint Peter, Saint Brigitte. And then I went on to experimenting with um, mythology, kind of broadening, broadening uh, these subjects. Uh, this is Icarus. Um, and, and again, you know, addressing the composition, experimenting with the textures. Um, here I'm collaging uh, book binders along with uh, the drawing itself. And uh, with the, the collage materials that I use, which, which you can see in the gallery, um, I'm always drawn to the tangible history, the patina of these surfaces and how they interact with the subject matter. Uh, this is Ophelia. Um, the scarab became uh, a motif that I kept repeating in the work uh, or works. Um, this is a Venus scarab, which ties to the, um, the paternal aspect of Venus. Um, how, how uh, the kind of the worship of that, of that female figure and then tying it to the scarab and how it interacts within uh, different aspects of spirituality. Uh, and, and I did a series of these on the Venus scarab. This is Trajan Reliquary. And, and again, as we go through these, try to keep in mind the, the compositions all somewhat are repetitive, um, but the subject matter do, does evolve over time. 
Uh, this is the seven sleepers. Um, this is, a again, as I'm digging through source material, especially at that time period, um, I would look for these uh, very obscure uh, stories. Um, I, I dug in the Golden Legend, which is a medieval text. Uh, this is a rare Russian subject called the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. So instead of showing the sleepers, I showed each of them as scarabs. But um, but I was, at this time, I'm becoming more and more interested in the color field and how that gold surface becomes a meditative element in and of itself. Uh, this is kind of a, a random subject, but I, I kind of throw these in periodically because, again, they do play a part. As, as artists, when we're doing large bodies of work, I think it helps us creatively if every once in a while we'll get off on a little tangent. And so um, I was digging through books and I found this page at the top says the Dance Macabre. And so I pieced together this composition that references that. Uh, and Four Saints. And so at that time, I, I had been creating this work pretty uh, frequently, um, doing shows. Um, and then I kept kind of being pulled toward kind of walking away from this figurative, uh, drawing tradition that that I had been focused on at that time for over a decade, uh, almost 15 years, I suppose. And um, I, I kind of kept telling myself, you know, I'm just going to walk away from this and go into a much different approach. And so um, I decided to basically eliminate the figurative aspects and become much more abstract in my approach. And that's where I had this idea of tying these linear elements into these compositions. These compositions initially were based on architectural forms found in medieval uh, churches and uh, spiritual centers, things of that nature. And uh, I would do them using vellum. So if any of you have used vellum, it's a translucent, semi-translucent surface. And I would draw on both sides of the surface. So in that way, I was doing something similar to, to the use of gold. The gold in relationship to the drawing were using two different surfaces and the depth that was being created from that. The same thing was occurring here with these architectural renderings. Um, if any of you are familiar with Richard Diebenkorn, obviously he was a major influence on these. Um, but I, I got pretty drawn into these pretty quickly and did several of these and then decided, you know, there's only so many architectural drawings I can do. And that's when um, I chose to kind of take this concept and put it toward the image of concentration camps. If you're familiar with the artist Anselm Kiefer, other German artists, their relationship to this history of their country and, and what had happened within Europe during World War II um, this was kind of part of myself kind of reacting to some of these feelings of seeing so many uh, images of the Holocaust, of understanding this history growing up, but having no direct connection to it. Um, so in lieu of looking at, say, a, a, a medieval church and how it's depicted, I began looking at these concentration camps. And so this is uh, Auschwitz. And then this is my interpretation of Auschwitz. Uh, again, uh, cutting together these, these linear compositions and creating this portal uh, for the images. Um, one influence in regards to, to these works, as you'll see, um, there's a documentary called Night Will Fall. Um, and it's about the uh, filmmakers uh, at the time of the end of the war when they were going into these concentration camps and documenting these atrocities and the abstraction of this film footage. And um, it was decided at the time of, of the Nuremberg trials and the end of World War II that these would be locked away because they felt that it would just demonize the entire situation, which it was truly horrific. But they have since released this footage and the victims, obviously the survivors of the Holocaust, but also of the soldiers, the documentary filmmakers, they all mentioned the abstractness of these environments. 
the the architecture of the camps, the, the, even the architecture of the the bodies, the the remains, all those things play a part in terms of how they saw the world, and that world would would change for them indefinitely. This is Block 11, where the where, which was the first location where uh, gas was used. Um, Gross Rosen, uh, an interior of a gas van, uh, roughly Chelno, Poland, 1942. And then my interpretation of those spaces. Chesmista, Mijadanik. Treblinka. And so I did several of those images and um, again, they're, they're very difficult subjects. And so um, as I'm researching those, um, you know, those experiences, I'm, I'm also always researching other things. And so I, I, on one of the Europe trips that the university took, I, I was in um, uh, Amsterdam at the, at, at the, the, Contemporary Art Museum and saw one of Barnett Newman's large painting, color field paintings called Cathedra. And it had a profound impact on, on again, my approach as an artist. And so this is a uh, kind of my interpretation of Cathedra. And these, again, are reference points to the earlier icons that I was creating. I was just taking out the, the saints or the subjects from them. And so they reference, for example, Rothko's Chapel, um, at the, you know, in Houston, at the Menal uh, Collection, uh, Barnett Newman, as well as contemporary artists such as Pat Steer and her waterfall paintings, and several other contemporary artists. So I let these color fields act as spiritual spaces for the audiences. And these, again, are very cathartic for me to produce after producing these very heavy pieces, which, again, are quite small. Um, as a side note, um, when I talk to audiences or artists about my work, um, the, I, I'm always drawn to these very intimate pieces, uh, these small uh, intimate pieces that draw you into the work. Usually if I'm at a museum, it's not the huge painting by Rembrandt that I'm drawn to, it's the miniature portrait he did some afternoon that, that draws me in. And, um, and, the, and these uh, pieces in general act the same way. Uh, this is called Byzantine Echoes. This is called Into the Deep, Meridian 1 and 2. Now, I mentioned every once in a while I'll get off on a, on a little tangent. And as I was putting this lecture together, this is one of my absolute favorite pieces. And um, it's called Brettlebane. And, and Brettlebane, of, for whatever it's worth, is the northernest most shipwreck in history. Happened in the North Arctic. It was a ship called the Brettlebane. And I just got sucked in one afternoon reading all about the shipwreck. And so this little interpretation is of that, of that um, event. Um, but uh, as a sad note, I, I hate to follow this with this image, but this um, is a very famous photograph by Kevin Carter. And again, as I'm, as I'm, um, researching and spinning all these plates, I've always been drawn to photojournalism. And, and if you study photojournalism, uh, you always research the, the Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalists. And uh, in 1994, Kevin Carter, who was part of the Bang Bang Club in South Africa, won the Pulitzer for this image of uh, the vulture and starving child. Very famous photograph. But what drew me to this was the story of this experience of Kevin Carter. Um, he was not a trained photojournalist, but got sucked into it, sucked into the rush. Um, again, if you're, if you're familiar with the university and our connection to the photojournalist David and Peter Turnley, from it, having known them over the years and being um, introduced to their archive of, of, uh, of, fo of photographs, um, I was drawn to, again, uh, Kevin Carter's experience. And so after he won the, the prize, he was bombarded with all this bad press of, you know, if he helped this child and the moral ambiguity of that, and he couldn't really give a straight answer. And within a period of just a few months, 
ended up committing suicide, partly due to, again, a lot of uh, issues within his life, but it was also kind of triggered by this event, which he was a part of. And so this uh, is, is called The Vulture and the Child, and a, a similar version of this is in the gallery. And so on the left, you have this interpretation of the vulture, on the right, the interpretation of the child, and in the middle is the door of his little pickup truck that he drove down to the river uh, near his home in South Africa um, where he committed suicide. And so it's a very sad, sad story of helplessness, of ambiguity, and that, again, ties into a lot of this work. Um, so the, the, this next body of work is what I've really focused on for the last uh, several years, and it all involves uh, the war in the Middle East, um, and specifically these Syrian elegies. Um, the idea of the elegies come from, uh, obviously, studying Robert Motherwell's uh, lifelong work of the Spanish Republic, the elegies to the Spanish Republic, where he did hundreds of these pieces, all specific to uh, what happened in the Spanish Republic uh, prior to World War II in the 1930s. Um, this quote comes from uh, Night Will Fall. Unless the world learns the lesson these pictures teach, night will fall, but by, by, by God's grace, we who live will learn. Um, unfortunately, this was said in relationship to World War II, and if you study what's been happening in the Middle East, specifically in Syria, uh, we as, a, as humans uh, are continuing to repeat our mistakes, um, sadly. And so uh, the first subject that I'm going to talk about is that of Palmyra and Tadmir, Syria. And, and Palmyra was destroyed by uh, Islamic State militants. Uh, it was a World Heritage Site, but what makes this place, this event, even more horrible is that the historian uh, who protected Palmyra, protected many of the scholars that were there, uh, was executed by these same militants. And so you see um, on the left uh, what was Palmyra and then what it was after the destruction. Um, Khalid al-Assad was um, again, trying to save what artifacts he could, save what people he could, but then too was executed by, um, by these militants. And so these, again, kind of uh, trace their aesthetic compositions back to the earlier concentration camp pieces. This is Nimrud, again, another uh, World Heritage site that was... Um, destroyed by these militants. Um, and the tower at Nimrud, uh, you can see kind of this um, abstract tower shape kind of tipping over a representation of that destruction. So this slide shows the first rendition by Robert Motherwell of his eulogy to the Spanish Republic. So as I mentioned before, there are hundreds of these that he created over his lifetime. Some are small sketches, all the way to massive size mural uh, paintings, large scale paintings. But it references a poem by Harold Rosenberg that again was written decades ago, but yet can be tied to what's been happening in Syria. I knew who had sent them in those green cases who doesn't lose his mind will receive, like me, that wire in my neck up to the ear. And uh, again, these are heavy, heavy subjects, but to some degree as an artist, um, something that I struggle with. And so each time I create one of these eulogies, um, it's a way to memorialize these subjects uh, so that they might not be forgotten. So these are some examples of Robert Motherwell's eulogy paintings. Um, this uh, references the Lament for Lorca, which uh, references the uh, Spanish poet Federico Lorca, who was uh, assassinated during uh, the War of the Spanish Republic. Uh, and again, if, if as students you're, you're well aware, obviously, of Picasso's Guernica, it was done for the same motivations. 
Um, this is uh, the destruction of Gouda near Damascus. Um, and then my depiction. Another image of Damascus. Um, I want to preface some of these images. Uh, again, I hope these aren't too uncomfortable, but I, I struggled with whether I should show them or not. Uh, hopefully these won't get too graphic. Um, but uh, this references um, an event where 20 Coptic Christians were executed. And the, these are my depictions of that same event. And what I'm trying to do with these pieces, and again, most of these are small, they draw you in as a viewer, is that I'm trying to create what I describe as whispers. These are not meant to smack you upside the face uh, because we've been smacked upside the face enough times. Um, as soon as you open up you know, your news feed each day, you're, you're smacked by something. And so these are not meant to be that, but rather delicate images that pull you in, that act as, uh, as memories, as condolences, uh, and, and the hopes that, that again, that, that they will not be forgotten. Uh, this is the Battle of Aleppo. Um, again, with regards to the Syrian conflict, and right now there's a lot of momentum with um, war, war crimes being put against uh, the Syrian government, specifically uh, the, the president of Syria. Um, because again, if, if you look at the percentages, the amount of innocent bloodshed with regards to this conflict is much higher than in most wars. Um, it's one thing when soldier to soldier uh, are, are being killed for a cause or lack thereof, but it's a whole nother thing when so many civilians and innocents are being killed. And uh, that's the, the, one of the, the worst of these war crimes is the use of sarin gas, which is the same gas that the Nazi regime was using and, and that they would bomb, the Syrian government would bomb these villages, these towns, and so you would naturally think, let's hide in the basements. Well, sarin gas is heavier than oxygen. So where does the sarin gas go but to the basement, to the most innocent? Here's a depiction of Aleppo. Here's the eulogy to the children. I've done a series on what I call these desert eulogies, and these two, again, are, I try to create these delicate compositions that tie to these terrible, terrible events um, that you can glance over and be drawn to them from an aesthetic point of view, but, but my hope is that, again, you'll you know, Google a title or, or dig in deeper or send me an email and ask a question and, and, and that there will be a, a further dialogue. Again, if, if you're uncomfortable by some of the images that I've shown, um, I, I, again, I, I don't wanna be gratuitous in what I'm showing, but I do think that these, again, tie to the context of these works. This is a prison, uh, and, and one of the images that are being used as evidence of, in terms of these human rights violations. Uh, this is an interior of one of these prisons, which again, if you look at this, there is literally no difference to this image. If I were to make it black and white, you would not be able to differentiate between this and the gas chambers of the concentration camps that I was showing from World War II. Desert Elegy two, three, four, This, again, in terms of digging into what's been happening in the Middle East, one of the saddest aspects is the execution of gays by these militants. And one way in which they create these spectacles is by throwing these victims over rooftops. And so this is, again, an interpretation of that. Rooftops in Mosul. 
again, these reference back to, to these desert elegies. Uh, these are strictly collage, but in terms of showing this, I do want to mention that I'm using the string as a, as a drawing mechanism. I, I look at how I kind of lay that string just like I would laying graphite or charcoal on the page. More examples. This is the Monastery of St. Elion, again, another site that was uh, demolished by uh, militants. And what it was shown afterward. And so this is, uh, again, kind of this memento mori of that, of that event. Another example. Um, this ties back to the meditation pieces of showing these color fields so that for anyone, the memory of this location can, can still be thought of and, and, and somewhat of a past tense, but still be used as a, in a spiritual sense. The last body of work that I'm going to show is that of uh, James Foley. Um, James Foley was also a photojournalist. And I've devoted a lot of pieces to his memory. He was the first American photojournalist to be executed by the uh, the, the you know by by Islamic State militants. Um, he he um, in terms of studying him, he and I kind of came from similar backgrounds, uh, had similar paths in life. But one day he decided to, he woke up and decided he was going to be a photojournalist, and went into these. Uh, difficult situations, again, to bring a voice to the voiceless. Um, he was incredibly compassionate, um, but uh, he was first captured in Afghanistan in 2011, but after 45 days in captivity, was released. But unfortunately, in uh, 2014, um, he was captured again, and unfortunately, uh, the U.S. government could not negotiate the release, and um, Again, sadly, he was executed. Um, and, I, and I won't go into too many details, but there is, there's a great documentary that was supported by his family on his life. Um, but a quote that he stated um, was that if he didn't have the moral courage to challenge authority, then there would be no journalism. And, and I think, again, the world in which we live, um, we have to keep that in mind because, again, uh, we history continues to repeat itself. Um, but James Foley's life, his memory, has been a, an inspiration to me, and, and hopefully these pieces can act as memoriams to him. This is his abduction near Aleppo. This is abduction three. Um, this is his imprisonment near the Children's Hospital at Aleppo. Two more depictions of the same subject. And again, as an artist, I, I do find it rather cathartic to again continually repeat these same compositions. Um, this is uh, the last prayer of James Foley near Raqqa. Um, and this really, this subject here kind of ties all of the work that I've kind of shown all, all together, it, it brings gold as a spiritual element into these pieces. Um, it shows, again, as sad an event as this was, that there is that hope that there is something greater, uh, that his sacrifice and the sacrifice of other journalists, other fighters, uh, other villages, um, that there is hope. This is a close-up detail Again, if you see images of uh, prisoners such as uh, when when James Foley was was um, you know was was in prison, um, the the orange jumpsuit is always something that kind of has a trigger, and so I do sometimes incorporate these orange linear aspects. This is the last prayer again. Another interpretation. Uh, this this one I, I exhibited in the last this last alumni 
uh, faculty exhibition, uh, a, a more recent one. And this is the most current one uh, and much more elaborate in terms of the composition. Um, but again, it's, it's taking this idea, this concept and continually learning from each piece and again, keeping this memory going. Um, and so I hope to do many more of these um, uh, in the future and hope to do these more in an installation format uh, on a much larger scale. Um, these last few images are from uh, James Foley's execution. And then the last image I'm going to show is uh, the execution of James Foley near Raqqa. And that's in the exhibition. Um, I'm gonna leave this by, by reciting uh, the prayer uh, or, or a poem called The Empty Chair for James Foley. This was written by Sting um, and was a collaboration with his family. If I should close my eyes that my soul can see and there's a place at the table that you have saved for me. So many thousand miles over land and sea, I hope to dare that you hear my prayer, and somehow I'll be there. It's but a concrete floor where my head will lay, and though the walls of this prison are as cold as clay, but there's a shaft of light where I count my days, so don't despair of the empty chair, and somehow I'll be there. Some days I'm strong, some days I'm weak, in days I'm so broken I can barely speak. There's a place in my head where my thoughts still roam, where somehow I've come home. And when the winter comes and the trees lie bare, and you just stare out the window in the darkness there. Well, I was always late for every meal you'll swear, but keep my place in the empty chair, and somehow I'll be there, and somehow I'll be there. Um, I would like to close with one last um, with one last quote by Robert Motherwell, and this really ties to my work. No true artist ends with the style that he expected to have when he began. It is only by giving oneself up completely to the medium that one finds oneself in one's own style. Um, again, I spent a greater portion, especially as an undergraduate student here at the university, of thinking that I would be a figurative artist and drawing the figure and studying the figure and had the opportunity to change uh, a, to a different course and find a, a body of work that, that has been truly inspiring. And, and so again, for, for the students that are listening, uh, I do hope that they'll have the same uh, courage or um, the same opportunity that if, if they feel compelled to, to move in a different direction to follow uh, their heart as artists. Thank you.